Tell us about that too. All right, uh, so real quick, we'll start with the beer that you have in your glass because uh, if I don't, you guys will drink it all and then you'll go, I don't have any beer, what are you doing, man? <laughs> all right, so uh, real quick, the, this month we're doing session ales. Uh, we're defining session ales as anything under 4.5%. And the reason for that is because uh, April 7th is International Session Beer Day. Uh, the the uh, day was chosen in uh, honor of the repeal of Prohibition, or what they call Little, uh, Little Prohibition Day, which was uh, when 3-2 beer became legal in the U.S. Uh, before uh, they fully opened up uh, alcohol again, because why not? Uh, so we're starting with what I think a lot of people would consider to be a classic session beer, at least in terms of what we can see here in the U.S., and that would be Guinness. Uh, you know, a good old-fashioned Irish dry stout, probably the biggest one in the entire world. Uh, also, usually the lowest alcohol beer in any bar that you ever go to, uh, and at least here in the U.S. again. And I always used to, uh, before craft beer became a big thing and people became more sophisticated with their beer knowledge, I would go hang out with people and spend all night pounding back pints of Guinness, and my friends would be utterly amazed. They'd be like, my God, man, you've done like 20 pints of Guinness, how can you still be standing upright? Because of course they were laboring under the assumption of, oh, dark beer is obviously strong beer. And we know that's not the case because you're all brewers, and you know the only reason that the beer is dark is because of the grain choices. So again, Guinness, probably the most widely available sessionable beer around in the world. Uh, what is the alcohol on it? Uh, this is, I think, 4.2% in this in this particular it's variety. Now, it, now, this is the uh, dra uh, draft bottles. Okay. Now, here's the problem. When somebody asks you, hey, you know, about Guinness and uh, what's it about, you have to realize that uh, the Guinness Brewing Company brews something like 21, 22 different varieties of the beer around the world. Wow. Yeah, so most of what we see is brewed in Canada and comes it comes into the U.S., and there's about, you know, like I said, 20 different varieties. My favorite is a variety that's produced in Dublin for export only to Belgium. And it's the uh, Guinness Special for an Export something or other stout, or uh, John Martin Guinness is also what it's called. And again, you only find that uh, really in Belgium and it comes in uh, tinier bottles. It's awesome because it's like eight and a half percent. It's like if Guinness made a beer that was like an Imperial stout that actually had flavor. They've actually started importing it. I, yeah, it's I saw it like last year. It was like, yeah. it, it comes in very rarely. Yeah. And I do buy it when it comes um, because I do enjoy it. And, and, you know, that's me who I don't tend to buy things from breweries that are awfully big. And Guinness is owned by one of the biggest uh, liquor companies out there. Uh, Diageo, Diageo, I don't know how you say it. I've never heard anybody say it. So Diageo. Uh, they pretty much own, you name a booze. They probably are the ones responsible for it. So yeah, uh, I think they're uh, they're either Jamisons or Bushmills, and the other one's Pernod or Pernod, Pernod, Pernod. Uh, and uh, they own Schmiernoff, and they own you know a lot of different things. They are literally the world's largest liquor producer. So they also have an own Guinness, which while we think of as being a Irish beer, uh, Guinness is actually headquartered in London. So what do we think of the Guinness? How many how many people when you were first starting your journey into good beer started your journey with Guinness? Because that was certainly it was certainly one of mine. Yeah. You know? um, and my problem is, yeah, you know, like Guinness, it's I nowadays that we live in this world where we have access to so many different flavors, so much uh, variety, Guinness just kind of seems like, meh, yeah. yeah. right? And that's a big problem. We'll talk about that with the session beers here. Uh, but now, while, while we've talked about the beer that you have in front, in front of you, uh, let's talk a little bit about what's going on outside. Uh, you guys may have noticed when you pulled up the giant mess going on out in front of the shop. Uh, we are actually canning a beer that we did here at the shop uh, last month, right? Or no, February. February. In February, uh, the uh, Saison Figola, or Saison du May, as uh, yeah. Colin put on the label. Uh, this is a homebrewed Saison that we did on the shop system, and we did, uh, we did uh, what, 40 gallons? Uh, pulled down, I think, 30 to the canners, uh, and they're canning it right now actively. This is 
for the judges and stewards at the Mayfair competition. It's our thank you gift. Uh, we've been doing this for the past couple of years, I think. Steve, we did uh, we did Ballaholic, what, two years ago? Last year? Yeah, I think we did. Uh, and so this year we're doing this year we're doing uh, a saison. This was based around the idea, uh, stole uh, part of the idea from Natalie, where you know the club is the Maltos Falcons, right? We have a Malta connection. Uh, so what we decided is that since this is springtime, let's do something Maltese inspired. And so the beer itself is based off the idea of uh, a Maltese Easter dessert called Figola which is basically a marzipan and citrus cake. And so this has some biscuit malts in it to give it some biscuity tones, uh, blood orange zest, lemon zest, blood orange juice, and a little bit of almond extract in the final product. And uh, they're actively canning it right now. Uh, feel free over time to go visit outside to see what's going on with the whole process. And then, yeah, volunteer to help out at the Mayfair and get your own, uh, get your own can of beer. Any idea how long it'll take them to bottle it all? Uh, no, no, no. Uh, these guys are out there right now. Thank you, friend. Uh, they're the, just the, getting started. Yeah, they're just getting started. Took some time to get us up. And by the way, th this is being done for us by uh, the guys at Beer Monks, who are uh, mobile canners. And they operate here in Southern California. And they are doing this for us uh, gratis. So, yeah. And this is also, by the way, their first time ever canning homebrew. So this is a uh, this is a big lesson for us and for them. Oh, that's cool. And it's kind of a fun experiment. And yeah, you know, we hope everybody enjoys it. And besides, come on, how badass is it that we have our own canner here? Exactly. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. cool. I was going to ask, is there any opportunity for like a group canning? Uh, not yet. Like I said, this is their very first time doing this. I know some other places do it, yeah. and this may be kind of thing depending upon how this goes, lessons learned, everything else. Yeah, we might we might be able to set this up as a thing. Yeah. I know, like uh, Denny Khan, my uh, co-author slash co-host of my podcast, uh, he has a mobile canning operation up in his neck of the woods, and they'll they'll can five gallons of beer for twenty five dollars, which is free. That's awesome. Spanking, yeah. You know, so uh, you know, who knows? If we do this right, we might do that in the future. So there you go. Feel free to filter up towards the front and see that going on. I think this is particularly spiffy and spectacular and fun, and totally do not miss out on the opportunity to see this because how often are you going to get to see this uh, in action? Yeah, that was a uh, talking about the one up in, uh, in Oregon, twenty-five. Uh, that sounds uh, like it might sound a little bit, uh, you know. Like twenty five extra bucks for on um, five gallons of beer, but it's actually cheaper than bottling it if you're using new bottles. Yeah. yeah. And if you and if you see the amount of work that's going on out here, you'll understand that like th these guys have been here since nine thirty this morning setting this thing up. It took us about an hour and a half to get set up. Well, they're still and, actually adjusting it, right. but they're running at a snail's pace right now to get things trimmed up, and then they'll start running faster. So yeah. They got so, about a case done already. Right? So I mean. That just gives you an idea that I mean, that twenty-five dollars. There's a lot of labor in terms of setup, and these guys are doing this for us right now. And then they're going to break down, clean, clean up, break down, and run to another job. This is literally how they make their money with this equipment: is they run from brewery to brewery or coffee shop uh, and can product. Uh, so, like, if you see uh, cans of cold brew coffee from a local LA uh, roaster, I forget their name right now. Yeah, there you go. They, they, it was B, uh, B Sweet? B Sweet. B Sweet. Uh, they can the coffee for them. So, kind of kind of cool. And it, it really is a big deal that they're coming out and doing this for us. Yeah. All right. So, uh, next up, we are going to one of my favorite breweries that we never really get to see that much of because uh, problems. Uh, Timothy Taylor, uh, up in the north of England in Yorkshire. Uh, these guys are probably most famous for a beer called uh, Landlord, uh, Landlord Bitter, which has won the Camera Best Beer of Britain award multiple times. What's it? Okay. Uh, all right. Camera is. Sure. 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 Turn on the fan. Y'all are generating too much heat. It's getting hot in here. Don't take off your clothes. All right. Um, but yeah, thank you. Thank you. At least some. At least somebody acknowledged I was making a bad joke. Um, camera is the campaign for real ale. Uh, just like we kind of went through a whole thing where uh, America's brewing industry died, effectively. Uh, Britain was facing the same thing. Now Britain is the home of what of what we would think of as session ale. 
the whole term session ale is really a British and Commonwealth thing. Uh, because the whole idea is, hey, go down to the pub with a bunch of your friends, sit down, and everybody has a beer. Now, the way the rules traditionally work, let's say uh, you and four of your best buds go down to the pub. The idea is that uh, all five of you, or all five of you, five, I know my numbers, uh, all five of you stand around. You know, literally, you guys are all sitting around a table, and everybody buys a round. And you're not allowed to leave until you buy your own round. In fact, leaving before you buy your round is uh, gauche, terrible, and a, uh, and a uh, defriending uh, violation of protocol, right, as we would think of it today. Um, it's socially binding contract. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so this is why, think about it this way. This is why session beer is such a popular thing. If it's you and six of your best buds and you're all at the, at the pub, you're not going to sit there and drink six pints of IPA. You're not going to drink you know, six, uh, you know, six glasses of double IPA and keep moving. So the idea behind Session Ale was you know, that you have beers that you can sit there, you can have multiples of, you can spend the night at the pub and walk away from the pub in not so bad of a shape, right? Uh, now, the whole, the whole session thing really kind of came up with the Industrial Revolution because people, uh, people decided it would be a good idea to lower the strength of beer so that you didn't have people losing their fingers in machinery, right? Yeah, you know, showing up drunk to work and hungover and all that. Uh, now, like I said, camera rose up in Britain in the 70s because uh, the British brewery industry was consolidating just like the American industry did. But more importantly, they were starting to move away from traditional cask ale service into keg beer. And the uh, camera started up as a consumer group concerned about the, uh, the rise of keg beer. You know, okay, what we think of as normal beer here in the U.S. Uh, keg beer was considered to be flat, lifeless, a violation of tradition, et cetera, et cetera. And camera really rose up to sort of help defend the idea of real ale. And so uh, Timothy Taylor has been one of the breweries that has won a, a bunch of awards for traditional real ale, cast condition and bottle conditioned beers. So this is the Bolt Maker. Uh, it's a uh, best bitter. So 4.2%, which is still fairly strong for uh, a lot of the British beers out there that would fall into the session world. In fact, in Britain, this wouldn't really be considered by a lot of people a session beer because it's over 4%. Here in the U.S. for session beer day, we're put, kind of putting a ceiling of 4.5%. All right, so a little bit stronger. All right, what do we think of the Timothy Taylor? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Timothy Taylor always has, you know, this sort of really great uh, uh, biscuit ball character to it. Uh, real strong mineral component, right? Yeah, very, very strong mineral component. Good expression of hops without being over the top. Uh, and, yeah, a definite potent yeast character to it. Anybody else get diastole? A little bit. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know me, I'm, I'm super sensitive to diastole. I totally get it. But, but that's, yeah, I mean, it's not, it's not necessarily incorrect. All right, well done. Yeah, now, if you ever get a chance to get fresh landlord on cask in some ways, you can find it in good condition. Totally just suck down as many pies as you can. Uh, I spent a very wonderful night in Scotland in, in a bar uh, just, uh, you know, not too far away from uh, Yorkshire, mm -hmm. and they had a uh, landlord on cask, and I probably had a good eight, nine pints of it that night. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is, that, is that a bitter or a brown one? Uh, it's a, it's a bitter. And it is fantastic. Totally worthwhile. Okay. Now, here's part of the problem. We don't tend to see a lot of English session ales here for the very obvious reason that because they are low alcohol, they don't have the aging characteristics that we would that we'd ideally want out of a beer that's going to survive transit across the ocean and untold number of hours and days and weeks and months spent on a shelf, right? So it's a very disappointing thing because one of my very, uh, one of my very favorite styles that I could not find an example of to serve for you guys today is a classic British mild. Yeah, a nice 3.2 brownish beer with a rich round malt character to it. <laughs> and you know what? Could not find one to save my life because they just aren't made. I was really super excited. I got all I got most of this beer at Ramirez over there on the, over in Boyle Heights. Yeah. And uh, I was wa walking around looking at the shelves going, okay, what am I gonna get? What am I gonna get? 
And I was like, yeah, I really want a mild bitter. Damn it, there's not really going to be a mild available. And I was passing by a mild. Hey, there's a bottle of mild. Awesome. I picked it up and looked. Mild at 5%. No. That's not a mild! You should have called Cook. Yeah. How about McDonald's? Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I tried to get I tried to get a hold of the boss, but uh, Josiah was on the on the road. Uh, um, but Solidarity's uh, big, too. Yeah. And I don't I, I didn't think they had it uh, after the last release. So no, they have some on tap. Okay. But all right. So this is a problem with session ales, and we'll talk a little bit more about this. We're gonna uh, let's uh, real quick show of hands. How many people prefer the Guinness? All right, and how many people prefer the Timothy Taylor? <laughs> Y'all are wise. All right. So now, like I said, session is a, uh, a term that we normally associate with Britain and the Commonwealth. Uh, and so uh, the favorite old school uh, Australian brewery, Coopers, uh, who uh, for the most part here in the U.S. we know for their sparkling ale, which is an indigenous Australian style. Uh, but this is their uh, pale ale. And uh, Coopers, we also know here in the U.S. because they provide a lot of extract kits. Yeah, so uh, a lot of cl if you're an old-time brewer, you probably eat, there's a good chance you may have started with Coopers extract, right? And a little dry packet of yeast. Now, uh, there's actually a really great uh, book, uh, Peter Simmons out of Australia. He's uh, just self-published a book called Bronzed Brews. Uh, you can get it on Lulu.com. And what's really great about it is he talks all about the rise of Australian brewing, what changed, what had to happen over time. And uh, he also covers the rise of Coopers and the sparkling ales, uh, which is, again, an Australian indigenous style. But this is sort of your classic pale ale in the more British vein. What's the alcohol? Uh, I think this was like 4-2. Uh, like Let me see. It was right on the line. I, there were so many. Uh, no, 4-5. Four, four, okay. Right on the line. There were so many beers out there that I was like, oh, that'll be perfect. 4.7. Yeah. 4.8. Yeah. Ah, you jerks. Right? Yeah. Well, but here's the thing. So a lot of American craft brewers, you know, and we'll get into the session IPAs in a moment. A lot of American craft brewers seem to set uh, session, uh, session IPAs around 5%. You know, you start seeing the, the word session here around 5, which is insane. You know, because 5%, uh, again, in Britain, it is a strong beer. You know, that's not a session beer. And so the idea that uh, here in America we're calling these things session beers while they're at 5% is a little crazy because if you look at like, the level of drunkenness that you get between 4% and 5% per pint, it does add up relatively quickly. Because your body is only getting rid of so much alcohol per, per hour, no matter what you think. Um, all right, let's talk to the Coopers uh, while they get ready for the next one. What do we get? Yeah. Got a nice bitterness to it. Uh, restraint, a little bit of citrus, a little citrus character. A little, uh, a little almost salty character in the, in, in the back. A little mineral. Yeah, um, but not, but not like that drying, like German sort of mineral minerality. This is a little salty to me. Um, lightweight malt, not, not a lot of like super big malt character there. But you know, you could drink a lot of this in a hurry. Is there a homebrew recipe for this? There's bound to be, yes. All right. Maybe in a tin? Yeah, uh, exactly. On a tin. All right. Any other comments? Where's the salt coming from? Basically, it's something about the water. Yeah, what's the alcohol? 4.5. Yes. It's a salt. Yeah, I mean, it's like, uh, like an actual sodium like characteristic. Salt. Um, all right. So, whoop. Oh. Hello. Cool. Uh, that obstacle's back. Yeah. Um, <laughs> all right. Well, uh, no, the problem, uh, the problem is I don't have as much mass to guard me against the alcohol anymore. All right. Show of hands, really quick. Guinness. All right. We got a couple of stalwarts there. Timothy Taylor's. My Hardaway still everybody's favorite. All right. And then the Coopers. All right. We got a couple of a couple of people going for the Coopers. All right. So. Now let's talk American session ales. Uh, turns out that uh, IPA is apparently a big seller. Who knew? Um, somewhere along the way, people decided that, uh, you know what, screw it, we're just going to brand everything IPA. And we had a style here on the, on the West Coast for a while, and it's in the Maltose Falcon style guidelines. 
Yes. West Coast Extra Pale Ale. And the idea behind Extra Pale Ale was I want something at Pale Ale Strengths with an IPA, IPA hop experience, right? Let me get that hop experience without necessarily getting all the booze, right? Because we started, you know, when I, when I first started drinking IPAs, they all came in around 6%, 6.5%. And then when double IPA appeared on the on the shelf after we had the big long arguments about, well, is double IPA actually a thing or is it just another term for barley wine? Uh, after that kind of settled out, we noticed a creep. IPA stopped being 6%, 6 percent, six and a half percent, started being seven percent, seven and a half. Some of them get up to eight percent, which is nuts, right? Uh, you know, it gets hard to drink uh, drink that, and so people started to pull back, and you know, they retook this notion of extra pale ale and rebranded it as Session IPA. So by far and away, right now, with craft beer in the US, if you're going to have a thing that's called Session, the only thing that seems to be able to survive the death knell marketing mon moniker of Session is Session IPA, right? And so you go and you look at the shelves, there are a buttload of Session IPAs out there. A lot of them are super thin and super bitter. Right now, last time I had the Down to Earth, and it's been a couple months. I really actually liked Down to Earth. I, I haven't taken my sip yet. Jim's <laughs> making, making, making a face. The thinness comes through. But here's the thing. But here's the thing. Compared to a lot of the session IPAs, quote unquote, this has a lot of hop flavor to it. The bitterness is actually relatively in check. I, I, it's it's a bitter beer, but you know, but hey, it's an IPA. But it's not. You have some of them like uh, Stone's Go To, right? Uh, which has a very strong grainy component to it. A lot of these have just basically like two row and not much else. But Stone's also has a very assertive bitterness to it. This doesn't. Um, I mean, it has, no, it has bitterness, but it's not. It's not. What it has that. is a grapefruit in your face. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. right. And this is very important to me because here's a key, key defining component to me about session beer. It's not just the alcohol. Though. Session beer should be all about whether or not you're going to be able to throw back multiple pints, multiple glasses of it. Right? There's a, a a lot of people like to joke on uh, on the interwebs where you talk about session beer. Yeah, people like to get their macho on, their dick swagger out there, and they go, "Hey, you know, yeah, double IPA is a session beer if you if you believe in yourself." That's what Beanie says. Short session. Um, do so, they use extract or what are they using? No, I, I, I think this is just straight up hops. Um, I didn't see I didn't see any hop extract when I was at the 2 uh, brewery. But uh, really, session beer should be about that ability to be able to have quite a few, right? I mean, that's the defining reason for it. And this one, to me, in comparison to a lot of the session IPAs, has that sort of ability to be able to go, go ahead, go ahead, you know, if you like IPAs. If you don't like IPAs, okay, not so much. But um, that's that's where that's what I think about session, uh, session beers as a key component. Screw the alcohol level. I've had absolutely horrible undrinkable beers at three percent, and I've had insanely deliciously super drinkable beers at nine percent. Now I'm never going to call a nine percent beer a session beer just because I can drink multiples of it. I'll just call. I'll just I'll, I'll just I'll just call it a good a good nightcap to get me to sleep. Um, I judged it at a home Some jerk made a light, a mild, smoke mild on it. That's why I said it's a jerk. Yep. Yeah, I know. I love that beer. Beanie's pretty. Uh, 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 Jim's referring to my uh, cherry wood smoke mild that uh, is really, really oh, you're awesome. You're the jerk. Oh, I'm the jerk. All right. Um, Beanie, is that a session? All right, now that's the last of the that's the last of the classical Commonwealth styles of uh, session beer that we're going to cover today. But now keep keep in mind there are a lot that we did not cover. Right, you have whole classes of beers. You got uh, browns, particularly milds, right? But like I said, I couldn't find a damn mild Southern English brown, which we very rarely ever see here in the U.S. 
uh, Northern English Brown. Newcastle is actually just over the line of what a session beer would be. Uh, yeah, it's, but yeah, keep in mind there, there's a big broad swath of things to find in Britain and the Commonwealth. Uh, and again, the word session over there really does mean something. You can get into a real strong argument really quickly about what a session is. Uh, when I did, if you look at uh, my website, experimentalbrew.com, I put up 14 homebrew recipes to do for session uh, beer day. And uh, one of the people I emailed and got a recipe from was Ron Pattinson, who does a great blog called uh, Shut, Up About Bar uh, Shut Up About Barkley Perkins, right? Uh, Barkley Perkins was a, an old uh, London brewery, uh, very big uh, for a, a long while. And Ron does a really great job of actually delving back into old brewing logs and actually figuring out what the history of the beer style really was as opposed to what everybody legendarily says it was. And he gave me a beer recipe, and it came in at under 4%, and he's like, his, his comment on it was, this comes in at four, uh, under 4% as a proper session beer should. He's very British. Uh, and so the word session when you're in a Commonwealth area can ignite wars. Remember, this is a period. This is a place where they call Stella the wife beer because it's strong at five percent, right? So, but the Brits don't have the corner, uh, the corner on the complete idea of a session beer. And so, I'm going to close us out with two sort of non-traditional, more sessiony beers, and we're going to start with a lost style that's been uh, that's made a massive resurgence here in the U.S if not so much in its homeland in Germany, and that's Goes, or Goza, or however you want to say it. Uh, and basically, yeah, yeah, by the way, you want to have, you want to have fun? Go to, go to Belgium and ask them how to say Goose. You know, depending upon where you are, there's about five different pronunciations I've heard. Goose, Goza, Goose. There's a whole bunch of them. I haven't seen. It. Uh, uh, I haven't seen. It. It's on bottles. I haven't seen it on draft, but uh, except for the word. All right. So real quick, uh, the basics it goes: or uh, think a wit beer gone sour with salt and coriander, right? So it's a low alcohol wheat beer or a wheat beer from the, uh, north of Germany, uh, a little bit of sour tang to it, coriander, salt, and usually also citrus peel. Uh, so very much kind of like a North German version of a wheat beer with a uh, twist. Now Anderson Valley, in particular, over the past couple of years, I think over the, like the past two years, has been playing around with goes as a as a thing. You'll see it all the time now in cans. They have a really awesome like I think they do a different one for every season. But they have like a, a, a spring one, which is blood orange, which is awesome. I just had that the other day. Yeah, that is really yeah. good. Um, and this is their briny melon goes. It's a watermelon goes up. And this comes in at 4.2%. Right? Now, the reason why I'm including this one in the next one is a lot of sour beers, uh, until the recent craft beer trend of, hey, we're going to do big sour beers, a lot of sour beers are in that session beer category in terms of alcohol strength. Yeah, a lot of your Lambics are under 4%. Yeah? So now we should get melon, we should get salt, we should get sourness. No, they literally add water. Now, almost Jelly Ranchers. But you get like that watermelon peel. Oh, yeah. So now here's here's one uh, one thing I always kind of consider about a lot of people's uh, attempts at goes, and this is true for this one. Not so much with the blood orange one. This is way salty. This is saltier than I like. Yes. By far and away. I just had a really great. Uh, I was in Dallas last month, and when I was in Dallas, uh, there's a Fort Worth brewery called Martin House. And they had a they had a goes that was on tap, that was sublime. It had salt to it, but it wasn't so much salt that you, that you felt like you were eating a handful of pretzels every time. <laughs> this feels like a handful of pretzels. Yeah. Do you know how this is sour? Uh, no, I I mean I can't say for certain, but I almost guarantee you this is a kettle sour. So uh, if you don't know, kettle souring is a, a relatively new technique in terms of uh, homebrewers embracing it. Uh, but basically the idea is our big worry about 
uh, making sour beers has always been infecting things down the line, right? Getting that lactobacillus or other cultures down the line, uh, and and the, and the amount of time. So uh, you know you'll hear people talk about doing sour mashes, but that's a little dodgy about how well that works. So you'll hear people also talk about kettle souring. Now one of the things is grain comes with lactobacillus on it; it just exists on it. We don't have a choice about it. That's part of the reason why we boil beer. Uh, so what you'll see people do in order to do kettle souring is they'll mash, they'll pull the, the wort into the kettle, into the boil kettle, they'll either uh, bring it up to a boil, kill off the lack of basilis and everything else that's on there and let it cool down, although well, that's kind of an advanced version of the technique, and then, or they'll pull it into the kettle, they'll add a handful of grain because they're trying to get the lack of basilis on the grain, or they'll pitch a pure lack of basilis culture. They'll let it sit in the kettle warm, you know, they'll maintain a temperature on it uh, up in the hundreds area. They'll let it sit warm for 24 to 72 hours. You know, they'll watch the pH, and I have a big long diatribe about pH that I'm not going to get into today uh, in terms of sourness, but they'll watch the pH, and when it gets to a point that they're happy with, they'll fire up the kettle. And what they're doing, they'll bring the beer to a boil, and that kills off all the lactobacillus. Right? Kill off all the lactobacillus. Treat the beer as you normally would, pull it over to your fermenter. Now you don't have to worry about souring agents on your seals and your fermenters, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and that's kind of the idea that they're doing. It allows you to get quick turnaround time with a lot of lactic acid production uh, and get a beer that should be relatively clean. If you've ever done a sour mash where you leave the, the, the mash in your cooler for like 24 hours, you know that that's a very bad smell, depending upon how you do it. And this helps avoid that uh, that problem. What's that magic number without getting into it? What? pH. Depends on what your taste. And that's the reason why I think pH is a terrible thing. It should be total, it should be TA. Yeah. TA is more associated with perception. What's that? Uh, the total acidity or tri tritritable acidic. Uh, it's a winemaking technique, but it's much truer to what your palate tastes than pH ever is. All right, what do we think of the, the goes? Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. yep. Alright, let's go through the list real quick. How many people? Guinness is your favorite? Ooh, scotch. Alright, the Timothy Taylor, the bolt maker. Alright, Cooper's Pale Ale. Alright, 21st minute back to Earth. Yeah, crap beer lovers. Alright, and then the Anderson Valley goes. All right, and finally, I include this one because this is also in the session beer strength area, but also because uh, the blendery did just open, so, uh, you know, to the public, and I figured that would be a good thing to feature some L.A. beer. L.A. beer. All right. Can you say anything about the blendery? What is the blendery? What is the All right. So, uh, for those of you who don't know, shut the hell up. Thank you. For those of you who don't know, uh, Beachwood Brewing Company down in uh, Long Beach is not only getting ready to open up a second brewing facility now, uh, taking over the old Beach City facility in Huntington, uh, but uh, they also just recently opened up uh, the blendery, which is also in Long Beach? Yeah, yeah right around the place in the brew pub. Right. Uh, so right around the corner from Brew Pub, and it's all based on, it's all sour and barrel aged beers uh, from uh, Julian and company. And this is the first set of bottles I've seen on the shelf. And uh, this is the 512 uh, Oats, Brett, Lacto, a couple other things, but it's 3.2. It's basically a Berliner Weiss with half of the wheat replaced with oats. There you go. So a little bit of funk to it. Which is uh, good, but now part of the reason, I, like I said, I wanted to include some sour beers in here because I want you guys to get the idea that we have a problem in the U.S. and I think amongst beer drinkers that we think that session beer has to be boring, right? Yeah. And there's a lot of room to play around with session beer. There are a lot of other flavors that you can put into beer other than alcohol, <laughs> right? I, mean, I know alcohol is everybody's favorite thing about beer because that's the reason why we drink the damn stuff. But there's plenty of uh, plenty of room to play around with interesting characters other than alcohol, and so sours and critters and all that are a good example of something that you can play with, right? So what are we what are we thinking? What are we getting? Very rosy, rosy, floral, floral. Definitely get that oat 
yeah. right? Yeah. It's a big oat, uh, big oat character to it. You know, is this uh, oats or uh, oat malt? Uh, oat malt. Right. Uh, oat malt, which is a old school English ingredient that until recently was only done by Tom, uh, uh, by faucets, and is now being done by more. Uh, Eddie, are we done out there? No. All right. Um, but yeah, this is uh, this is just a really wonderful nose. I mean, I love the complexity in the nose. Yeah, you get that little bit of light sourness. Yeah, definitely a very clean lack of character. You know, I, I'd like to comment briefly on, on how a, we talked about a sour mash, and I learned this from Jenny Duros of Flop, and, and the trick is you cover your mash tun with a blanket or something, something that a plastic blanket right away so it's not exposed to air. You even go to the trouble of burping out any air, you know, you cover it so there's no, zero chance of air, and, and you put it in an ice chest, and uh, make, you just, once a day or so, you have to add some hot water to it boiling water just to maintain your temperature and you want to keep it there between about 90 and about 105. You do that, you'll get just mostly, almost completely the clean lactobacillus rather than the enterobacters, which, yeah. which, uh... Yeah, and ent enterobacters love oxygen. And so the second you get any oxygen, or lactobacillus, by the way, hates oxygen. So if you've got your, if you've got your mash on the food like this, I've seen people not only wrap it in blankets, but also plastic wrap the whole damn thing. After, after taking a CO2 bottle, right, taking your CO2 tank, and, and pumping in a bunch of CO2 over the top, and then sealing it up with plastic wrap thing, and then wrapping the whole damn thing up, just to minimize oxygen exposure. You'll see that people do the same thing with their kettles, right, where they, they pull the wort out of the mash tun into the kettle, flood the kettle with CO2, and then wrap it up to just prevent oxygen pickup. I suspect they did this. Again, what does the air do to the... The air has got enterobacters. Well, the, well they don't, actually, that's anyway in the, in the malt, isn't it? Mm -hmm. But it, the, the enteric factors give you, you know, a vomit type smell. Or the, you yeah. all, no. all of us have had a brain that yeah. we brought home, right? And then you smelled it like the next day. Yeah. And it's yeah. awful. Yeah. yeah. If, you've ever, if, you've ever left, if you've ever left your mash tun overnight right. and not cleaned it out yes, or right. like yeah. for longer, <laughs> uh, like maybe you've just been ultra stupidly lazy. I, not that I would ever know anything about this. <laughs> um, and you go, you open it up, and it smells like hell on earth, like a rotten corpse. Yeah. That's that's a combination of lactobacillus, enterobacter, a whole bunch of things. But again, enterobacter really, really works well with oxygen. Lactobacillus doesn't. Lactobacillus hates oxygen and will actually stymie the growth of your lactic acid bacteria. So minimizing oxygen exposure minimizes the chance for enteric bac uh, bacteria or, uh, to create those sewage shit rotting corpse smells. You know? Yeah. So this is why it's a good idea. I've heard of people actually bubbling CO2 constantly through the water. Yeah, but that's insane. <laughs> I, I love people, but that's insane. John, how many days does it take if that's at 90 to 1? You know, she tests it after two days. If it's not sour enough, then she'll let it go on a third day. But it's, it's really to taste. And that so, temperature is the best to extract the lactobacillus. Lactobacillus as likes me as possible. Does it? Okay. Yeah. So, it's it's not not cold, but it takes it, a few it, weeks. It's like 90 to 110 okay. is like ultimate. Perfect range. Okay. All right. The, the lacto on this was mild, slight-handed. It wasn't like the or wall, which I can't stand. How did they, they maintain the level of, of keeping it going badass? Well, so you know, is this kettle soured or is this? This is not kettle soured. This is all lacto fermentation right. from a yogurt culture. Which is harder. Yeah, kettle sour is easy because kettle sour you literally measure and taste, and then you set your lactic acid level by when you start your boil. But yeah. And this ended up with a pH of 3.2-ish. Yeah. yeah. You still have to do it at the 90 degree temperature with the okay. Yeah, afterwards. So it, it's basically like a normal pitch. Yeah. But that, that takes longer and it can be a little more finicky. And uh, lactic cultures can be sort of difficult to get established. So, all right, any other comments about the uh, 512? What's floating? Uh -oh. <laughs> the floaters. Well, 
Look, there's not exactly a lot of uh, clarity. Alright, any other comments about the 512? Alright, let's do the let's do the rundown real quick. Get us? We still scotched on that? Oh, we got one back. Okay. Uh Timothy Taylor, bolt maker. There we go. Uh Coopers, Pale Ale. Two on A back over. Hop heads. Uh Watermelon Goza. Alright. Uh and the Beachwood Blender 512. Oh, there it is. <coughs> See, all right. Now, when, when is the blender open? Is it uh, right now? It's, the tasting room is only open to the public on Saturdays and Sundays. Uh, we'll be adding Fridays soonish. There you go. Um, and it's actually, if you can find them or if you can make it to the tasting room, Ryan Fields, who's our head brewer in the blendery, has been messing around with uh, these Berliners. So there's this one, which is Berliner oats. There's also a Berliner rice. Oh, nice. And a Berliner Rye. Really? All right. And now, as a special guest beer that is not a session beer at all, uh, we have from Beachwood, we have their Troll Seeker IPA. And how many people have ever been down to Beachwood? Yeah. All right. How many people have never had Beachwood beer? No, never. All right. Oh, so, so, well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, now, uh, Julian, who is the head brewmaster, uh, guru of the beer at Beachwood, uh, started as a homebrewer uh, for years and years. He used to hang out with him down at Southern California Homebrewers Festival, and then he decided that he uh, wanted to make the brewing his day job. Poor bastard. Uh, but uh, Julian was always known for, uh, he did really great saisons and Belgians, but also a real love and breadth of IPAs. And so, if you go down to the brew pub in Long Beach, this is totally what you will see on the menu. A lot of, a lot of Belgians and a lot of IPAs. I mean, how, how, many, how many variants of IPA are there right now? On right now, five. And like, in total, it's like, you know, endless. And he's, he's, he's brewed at close to 200 beers in four and a half years, so... Whoa. Yeah. So... Kind of, kind of nuts, and uh, I know Long Beach is a long way down the uh, down the roadway from here, but uh, it's well worth the trip to go get some of this beer. <laughs> Just to say, last year at Southern California Home Brew Festival, Julian gave a seminar. He was one of the speakers that gave a really in-depth seminar about saisons and sours. It was really wonderful. It's also maybe worth going down there for Memphis-style barbecue. Yeah. Yeah. So now, obviously, this is not a session beer. This is what, 7%? 7.1. 7.1. See? What did I tell you about IPA creep? Uh huh. Um, but very tasty, right? I mean, like, this is actually kind of dangerously drinkable, like, in terms of balancing a big, juicy hop character, a little bit of that pine cone thing, without, uh, you know, without getting the malt too much in the way, but also not going, like, full West Coast, you know, screw you, malt, I'm only doing two row because I need sugar. You know? Um, What do we think? Well, well, it's far from being a session beer, though. Yes. <laughs> you don't like us, do you? No. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Jimbo uh, hates all IPAs. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Look, oh, I totally forgot. I introduce yourself to the crowd. I, I'm Aaron, by the way. All right, guys. Aaron Terrell, I work for Beachwood, former member of Long Beach Home Brewers. Um, I don't brew there. But I'm around the brewers all the time. So. And, and he, bring, he brought us beer. And I brought us beer. Who are our favorite sorts of people? I want to bring us beer. Yeah. All right. But, guys, yeah. going back to the session beer thing real quick, while, while you enjoy your glass of non session beer, um, remember that session beers are a good thing. I mean, particularly this, as we're coming into summer party season and fest season. One of the biggest problems I, I have every time we go to like, we have our one of our fests. You know, we go to Southern California Homebrewers Festival. We have Mayfair. We're doing Arrowhead later this year, or Oktoberfest, or just even the parties you're throwing in your backyard. You know, while we may really love and you know sort of 
chase after those uh, ethanol-infused beers that are extracting all these flavors and putting them straight into our brain pan. Yeah, you know, it's a damn good idea to have beer on hand that you can sit there and have multiple pints of. You know, something that you can have as a, yeah, pick me up at the end of the workday or slow me down during a party or just a maintainer, right? I always, uh, I always will tell people, I, I play pool the best when I'm about two beers in. If I get three beers in, I'm terrible. So if I can get two drinks in and then maintain with a session beer. I'll take everybody's money. <laughs> now, but that's just to, that's just to keep this in mind. Session beers are a good thing, and they don't have to be boring, right? They're a really great way for you to, to play around, get different characters from your malts, and really explore what your malt means in, the, in a beer like that. And they're really challenging because, again, you're not packing in a ton of flavor, right? You're not, like, going, ah, screw it, here's another bushel of hops and another, you know, quarter kilo of malt, you know, it's like now you're dealing with tiny uh, tiny things that actually give real perceptible, perceptible changes. So I highly encourage you guys play around, uh, play around, do some session beers. Learn your yeast. Learn learn your water qualities, how those affect your session beers. But most importantly, make sure you have some beer on hand that you can have a couple of glasses of in a night and enjoy yourself. I really think the milds is a really good choice. They're yeah. super fast, turnaround yeah. beer. You can have a, you can brew a mild in a week mm -hmm. and drink it mm -hmm. in a week. Yeah. In seven yeah. days, you can be drinking your mild. And it's going in. It's it's wonderful. You walk in, pull a full pint, suck it all the way down. It's just it's fabulous. Yeah, three, uh, three or four years ago for Southern California Homebrewers Festival, I decided to challenge uh, myself. I decided to challenge myself and say, hey, you know, uh, the club doesn't have enough mild, uh, you know, isn't going to have enough sessionable beers on hand. This does happen to us a, a lot, which is the reason why, I, you know, I'm, I'm saying you guys, brew some damn session beers, please. Uh, and I knew we weren't going to have enough, so I actually challenged myself to see how fast could I turn a mile around. I've got a mild recipe that I do all the time. Love that beer. It's fantastic drinking beer. And from mash to time being served at the festival, including the transit time to get to the festival and hook everything up, was five days. Alright. Good job. What I do, I, I have this uh, outlined on the website. I get my beer down to, uh, to temperature like to 35 degrees. Uh, I look up on the chart, you know, okay, like if I want 2.5 volumes of CO2, right, you know, in terms of carbonation, and my beer is at 35 degrees, I need to set my regulator to, you know, like 10, right? And the idea is set to 10 and, and leave it there, is how those charts are set up. So what I do is I set my regulator to 11, I go plus one, it's one louder. Um, yes. <laughs> yeah, I'll set it to plus one of whatever's on the chart, and then I'll just take the keg and set it on site and just gently roll it back and forth for 10 minutes. And that's all it takes. Plus, you, you know, Drew, we have, we have hand pumps also. The club yeah. has hand pumps. So if you brew a mild and bring it to one of our festivals, yeah, whether it's the, well, yeah, any of our theater festivals or the Homebirds Festival, it can be served on the hand pump also. Mm -hmm. And it's going to vary it that way also. So the, it's, super, it's super easy to do. But again, like I said, uh, and, and part of that was inspired by, uh, you remember, we started the tasting off with Guinness. Uh, part, of the, part of what made me uh, you know, really start to think about this was years ago, MB, uh, who's uh, no longer with, uh, down here in the club, uh, just up in Seattle or I think. Uh, but MV brought a St. Patrick's Day dr Irish dry stout that was four days old. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so it's completely possible to turn session beers around really quickly and do them really well. And so that's another reason to also focus on doing some sessions because, hey, it's a good way to restock the larder. And, <laughs> and for those of you who are stupid like Beanie, I like to make giant goddamn beers. Nothing wrong with that. I can water them. He makes them all. Right. Well, right. well, right. right. there are two good things about session beers from this. One, if you want to make a ten plus percent beer, the best way to get enough yeast to be able to do that mm -hmm. is to brew a session beer. Yep. Yeah. Brew, brew five gallons, ten gallons of a mile. Grow up a giant yeast cake and use that yeast cake on your monster. Yep. It's the best way to make anything. Like when we did the Falcon's Claws beers for a couple of years here, you know, the best one that we did 
was one where we took the yeast and I brewed like 10 gallons of starter session lager and then used that yeast cake on the on the big beer, you know, on the 14, 15% beer. Turned out the best. Uh, the other thing is also if you're brewing big beers, a lot of times you're leaving sugar in the mash tun. You can make a session beer out of that pretty easily. Um, yeah, pretty gal. And, you know, so really just, there's lots of reasons to do session beers. Do your session beers. Enjoy your session beers. Be safe. Thank you. Session beers. <laughs> and remember, April 7th, International Session Beer Day. So have a couple session beers that day. <laughs> Craig Chaplin's going to do a demo, but before we do that, anybody else bring any beers they want to share? Beanie brought a session beer. Well, it's got his, I think, up on the board. Well, and then, yeah, let's do the hop extract demo. And probably take a break to start everybody the canning thing. I'm going to run out real quick and check on it. Well, if we all go out at once, it might be chaos. It might, you know, for those of you... Take them by rows. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know who that organized. Excuse me. Falcons and organized don't go together. Yeah. 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 Try not to have one. Go out there once. Falcons and disorganized. Yes. There we go. Disorganized confusion. All right. So Chris Chap was a longtime brewer, uh, member of our club, and he's actually a commercial brewer as well now. For is that a contract brewery, right? Contract brewery. Yeah. And uh, this is a beer that they would never brew because I think you guys you specialize in uh, American lagers. American lagers. So this is not exactly American lager. So take it away, Grace. All right. Yeah. 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 Okay, thank you for allowing me. I'm Craig Chaplin, I'm one of the Falcons. I do a lot of IPAs. Yeah. And what I asked you to let me do is come in and talk about something that I've been experimenting with and I think it really improved my ideas, and that's using hop extract. Hop extract is available right now from Northern Brewer in five milliliter syringes, which is roughly about one ounce of a 12 alpha acid hop. What I use for my plenty recipe is I use... Oh, no. oh thank uh, you, Candy. <laughs> I can talk in the dark, that's all right. The power went out. The power went out. The power went out. Oh, I'm going to say. It's so much fun. Are you still in the microphone? I can see you. Chris. Good morning, Greg. Okay. Lost power. Keep going. So what I do for my Pliny recipe, where I want to have a really strong, hoppy backbone on the beer, is I use Pliny extract. 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 Pliny is I use four of those hop shots. So I use 20 milliliters of, of the extract. I use two syringes at 90 minutes and two syringes at 60 minutes. And what I'm going to show in this demonstration is how best to utilize that hop, ex hop extract. Ballpark cost? Hey. Uh, $3.99 for five milliliter. What's, what's the... I know, but what's the reasoning for using the extract? Well, the, re the reason oh, why you want to use extract is you can get that high, hoppy flavor in your beer without any of the vegetal or garden matter that is in hop pellets or leaf hops. Yeah. Also, the, not, the, 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 also, one of the things I love about it is you don't have the mass that sucks up beer that you can no, drink. No, there's no volume loss. Yeah, yeah no volume well, loss whatsoever. Like yeah. I'm brewing 10 gallons. So, you know, you could cut that in half for a five gallon batch, although I'm thinking about going another hop shot at 90 minutes just to get it up even more. But the way, the way you use this extract, they recommend you inject it directly into the wart from that syringe. But what I found is you get this little snake of extract floating around your boy pen that sticks to the sides and ends up not in the beer at the end. So what I do is I've got this with high temperature measuring cup here, this is up to 450 degrees. 
and you can fill it with wort. I tried that, injecting the extract into it to dissolve it before putting it in the beer. That didn't work all that well. It stuck to the sides of this thing. <laughs> so what I determined I was going to try is dissolving the extract in a grain alcohol first. So I add about three ounces of grain alcohol into this cup. Then I go ahead and inject the extract into that, stir it up, and then I can pour that into the wort. And it's mostly dissolved. There's very little left behind. So it's a very effective way to get that extract actually into the beer and not stuck to the sides of the cup. Where are you getting your ever club? You can get it at any liquor store. Total Wine has it, BevMo has it. I don't recommend drinking it, but it's for, this purpose, <laughs> for this purpose, it's but, great. But you know what's really right. I recommend <laughs> take, uh, taking that and pouring it into a jar of maraschino cherries and letting those sit for a couple days. Oh, oh, yeah. cherries. Maybe once a year, like a bitch in air. But by doing uh, 90 and 60 minute additions, mm -hmm. you get more bitterness than anything else, right? So it, This is all bitterness. Okay, okay. Yeah. So, But you still add other hops for aroma and flavor. Yes, absolutely. I've got a recipe here. If Drew wants to post it on the side, I won't go into details about it. But also at 60 minutes, I add some Columbus hops. Then there's regular pellet additions at 30 minutes and at knockout. So, if Drew wants to post Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll totally post it. And you, you talked about why, why did the extract is where you get your extract? Uh, yeah, I did. And and I'll tell you the best source of extract, if you're really interested in this and may brew several of these beers in a year, is you can go to Yakima Valley Hops and they'll sell it to you in a can. And right? the can is 100, 100 milliliters and it's like $23. So it is a lot cheaper than buying the syringes from Northern yeah. Brewer. And whatever you do, don't open up the can, mm -hmm. dip your finger into it and go, <laughs> no. <laughs> they, they, actually, Vinny tells, if you listen to the podcast with Vinny, he tells funny stories about that's what they do with new brewers and doctrinating them into the brewery. Is you put that on your tongue and you don't taste anything else for a week. <laughs> it just blazes your taste buds. Yeah, I, it, 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 it's... Shocking. Yeah. <laughs> and so what I what I do when I'm um, by that big can, and I'm not going to use the entire contents in that particular brew, is I go ahead and bought this on eBay, which is just a, a medical style syringe. And you can go ahead and take that can. I set it next to the burner to get it a little more liquid because it's like a tar substance in the can. Set it next to the burner, let it kind of liquefy a little bit, then draw out the amount you want to put in, put it into the, the Everclear, and mix it up, add that to the oil kettle, and you've got an effective addition of that extract with it liquefied, ready to go in. Wow. Well, hops have coumulin. Is this mm -hmm. a high or low coumulin type of addition? I think this is just bitterness. I think yeah. this just, is just, bitterness. just pure bitterness. Well, you get bitterness like uh, when you drink an arrogant bastard from the. No, it, 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 I, I don't think I don't think any of the uh, the other oils are coming in. It's just literally ice oh, acid. Yeah. yeah. So it's synthesized with CO two, isn't it? Yeah, usually a supercritical CO two yeah. extraction. Okay. Which, by the way. Super, super fun. I tried to figure out how to do it at home. Uh, super, super dangerous. Don't do it. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, have you tried this method with a lower proof alcohol, like a 40% vodka or something? Uh, I haven't. I just went with the, the highest proof yeah, that I could sure. get for this. You, know, you want to dissolve you know, with, the, with the amount of stickiness that this stuff has and you know, its tendency to kind of bind to anything, uh, you really want to get it as dissolved as quickly as possible. Okay. Kind of boil out anyway. Yeah. When you were experimenting with how to introduce it into the wart, did you mm -hmm. try putting the liquid into the bag, the mesh bags that we already use, and putting that in to the kettle? And did it work at all? The liquid into mesh bags? Mm -hmm. When you're doing a hot bag, extract so into a hot bag. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. just going to turn into clogged. It's going to it's going to stick. It's going to stick, it's gonna stick to the insides of the hot off, bag. It won't melt off with the heat. No, like, no. seriously, guys, that's if you never mess around with this stuff. It's really hard to understand exactly how resinous this is. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's you know, it's it is it is like tar. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, it's way worse than honey. Yeah, it's like tar. It, it really is that thick. <laughs> it's really, it's really <laughs> <heavy>. <laughs> yeah. 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 I was thinking the case. Did you find a difference in uh, from this method and just putting it straight into the oil kettle? Did you find any difference in the uh, exact cleanliness of the oil kettle afterwards? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> that was where I'm going to end this talk. Is how you clean up this mess afterwards because it is a mess. 
even using this method where you get most of it into the beer, you still have balls of it, you know, stuck to the boil kettle. Seriously. And what I do is I fill up the, the boil kettle, heat it up to maybe 120 degrees or so, and I dump in three scoops of OxyClean. And I let it sit for an, an hour, two hours. What PBW is pure OxyClean? OxyClean. It works the best from what I've tested. Unscented. Unscented. Yes. No <laughs> no scent crystals. Just the pure white Oxy, OxyClean 3 is the product. And three scoops of that in the boil kettle. Let it sit for a couple of hours or just overnight. You drain it off and most of that extract is gone. A little you may have to wipe out with a sponge that you don't want to use for anything else. Because it will gum that up badly. But it cleans it up very nicely. So. Yeah, the, um, what, I, what I understand is you can only use it for a bittering hop. Can you use it for a flavoring hop? No, they, there's actually new products they're coming out with that is hop extract for aroma and for flavor that are like small little droplets of that. I know Lady Face yeah. has experimented the, with that. The, the hop there have been, there been hop oil, uh, hop oil yeah. extracts around for a while, but they're really starting to refine the process now. But yeah, I mean, this stuff is all just bitter. You're not going to get any hop flavor out of it. Okay, now we'll go ahead and pour the, the what I'm calling my Pliny the Clone. Uh, like I said, I may up the bittering a little bit on the next batch. This is Elder. Elder. And Craig and I sat down with uh, Pliny the Elder on draft and his older version of this one and some other commercial examples. And it's amazing. All three had extracts, so it's an all amazing the flavor profiles of all. If you want to get bitterness in your beer without getting any of the, the flavors of vegetal or garden or like that, just clean, clean bitterness, think about planting extract. And there's a guide on Northern Brewer site that I recommend you download if you're going to do it. And it talks about how much you use with the gravity of your wort and how many IBUs you're trying to build with that addition. So this will guide you into how much you should be using. And for Pliny, it's it's somewhere over here. <laughs> yeah. I mean, no. the, so the real thing is, hop extract has a hop extract has a bad reputation with uh, good beer lovers because of the use. It's used by folks like Miller, right? You know, where mm -hmm. Miller uses hop extract instead of using hops. So it gets a bad name. But like anything else, it's a tool, right? And sometimes, you know, the, the tool may be mostly abused, but there are good uses for it. And this is a perfect example. Yeah. And speaking of tools, what extract did you use? I used the back of Yakima no, 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 Valley. No, what, yeah, but what type of product? No, they don't tell you. It's, it's, I think it's CTZ, really. Yeah, I mean, remember, so, right, you know, remember that the American hop industry for years had a, an obsession with as much alpha acid as possible, right? Yeah, all, all the new varieties for a long time were all about the more, the more alpha acid, more alpha acid, more alpha acid, more alpha acid. And that's because they were being paid by the amount of uh, alpha acid per pound because a lot of it was going to make extra right? So the the varieties here, because again, they're <laughs> extracting into just the iso al or the the alpha acids that you're isomerizing. Yeah, variety doesn't matter. It's just yeah, literally a right. pound. Nowadays, all these new hops are coming on the because of the craft beer movement. The emphasis is not on the amount of alpha acid; it's on the amount of essential oils. Right. So there's a change. Any other hops in there for flavoring, or is it just? Like oh yeah, sure. oh yeah. There's a lot of pellet hops in this yeah. as well. But the majority, 50% of the bittering in this recipe, according to calculated bittering, is from the extract. So if this is mainly a bittering, does the oil time make much difference? Yes, it'll increase the efficiency of the hop. Like the the calculations that they give you for hop bitterness here is based on a 60 minute boil. If you increase the boil to 90 minutes, they say add 10%. To what that yeah, factor is. I, this one's not, I mean, it's not over there. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yes? Not to make a total parallel, but like the whole cannabis world is kind of moving in that direction and has actually done it before. The off of beer world. If anything can be learned. 
being a like three hundred dollar beer. Yeah, well, also, yeah, also, yeah, also yeah, 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 that I mean, you drink about a half a pint of beer and you very happily and you're going to be We had great sales of lunch that day. Hey, guys, one last question here. You said you made a mess in the bottle kettle. What about downstream? Do you have to throw away all your hoses or I haven't noticed any problem downstream, and I've brewed two beers since I've brewed this one, so, and they haven't picked up intense bitterness, so. Uh, so I, I think, I, I think it's going to stay in the boil, boil pedal with, uh, pedal with everything else, so you're just going to get the liquid. Uh, also, Craig's process of how he recirculates and does everything through his, his cleaning is, is meticulous. So, uh, it just doesn't put it in and say, yeah, okay, we're done with the book, and it runs through the entire system consistently. When I run a whirlpool, I run it through the entire cooling system. I run it hot to make sure everything is you know, up to temperature and set before I run it into the fermenter. By the way, looking, looking at the list here, I'd like to say, Oh, uh, you can get it on the uh, Amazon uh, search for not very good. You can also get it at the <laughs> kitchen <laughs> store. <laughs> so uh, kitchen uh, store. Uh, 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 high end. Uh, 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 so it has been a lot of water. I'm going to be down for water. All right, so we're going to be.